Welcome to Journey Through the New Testament. I'm Dr. Christopher Cohn, and this is Episode 5. In Episode 5, we'll continue our walk through Acts and the Pauline Epistles. Uh, we'll look today at Philippians, Philemon, Ephesians, and Colossians. Uh, these four letters Paul wrote uh, during his uh, first imprisonment. And so we'll take a look at these uh, letters and see what they have to say. So we start in Philippians. Uh, Paul wrote this roughly 61 AD, uh, early on in his uh, uh, first imprisonment in Rome. And we learn a little bit about his imprisonment in Rome as he describes the conditions and the challenges that he's facing in uh, Philippi. But he's challenging them. The theme is uh, to, to walk with God despite affliction. So he's encouraging the Philippian believers that even amidst great difficulty, they can still walk with God. And uh, Paul gives evidence of that because his ministry uh, is uh, one that's taking place under house arrest, and he's chained to Praetorian Guard individuals uh, kind of 24-7, night and day. And very interestingly, uh, Paul mentions that they're all getting saved, <laughs> that they're all believing in Christ, and uh, he references this a couple of times throughout the letter, uh, a huge reminder that uh, we can walk with God despite affliction. God's uh, not imprisoned, His gospel is not imprisoned, His word is not imprisoned. The summary and outline of Paul's letter to the Philippians, to the church at Philippi, uh, is, uh, is kind of pretty straightforward. Uh, in chapter 1, he recounts his circumstances in, uh, in affliction and the difficulties and challenges he's facing. He challenges uh, the believers in Philippi, in chapter 2, to unity, uh, even in the midst of affliction. Uh, there's some disunity there. He has some gentle chastising for a couple of individuals there in the church who are uh, kind of sowing the seed of disunity. He encourages believers in chapter 3 to perseverance, uh, even in the midst of affliction. And then uh, in chapter 4, encourages them uh, regarding how they can have peace in affliction, in difficult circumstances. Uh, so there are some really incredible highlights in this letter. Uh, first of all, in chapter 1, verse 6, we're reminded that, that God will complete his work. Now, remember, the Philippians had invested in Paul and his ministry, uh, and uh, imagine their discouragement when Paul is imprisoned, and they feel like uh, the gospel is imprisoned, uh, God's work won't go forward because the minister of the gospel is in prison. Well, Paul reminds them in uh, chapter 1, verse 6, that, uh, that God's work in them, through them, that he started in them, that he used them, uh, the believers at Philippi, to, to, uh, to begin and to, uh, to advance, that God would complete it. Now, sometimes we use this as, a, as an individual passage, that what he's begun in us, he will complete. Well, that's very true. We learned that in Romans chapter 8, for example. Uh, but Paul is really talking about the, the work that they had done, uh, that, that uh, God would complete that, that work uh, that he had begun in them and through them would be completed. In other words, their work wouldn't be in vain. Uh, again, as Paul is imprisoned uh, and uh, doesn't have the freedom to go about and proclaim the Word of God uh, in the synagogues and in the various cities as he had been, uh, he uh, m explains that the Praetorian Guard had come to salvation, that they had believed in Jesus and uh, they knew the Lord, and that's pretty remarkable. Verses uh, 12 through 14 of chapter 1, he says, My circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Uh, in my imprisonment uh, in the cause of Christ, it's become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard, uh, and others have more courage to speak because of that. And then as he concludes the letter in uh, 422, he says, the household of Caesar greets you as well. Just that passing reference uh, that would tell the Philippian believers that uh, the gospel is having huge impact. The household, the very household of Caesar uh, are coming to know the Lord. Then we see uh, in chapter 2, 
uh, as Paul is challenging the Philippian believers to unity even in the midst of difficulty, he challenges them to unity, uh, which requires humility. And so he provides in chapter 2, 5 through 8, the, uh, the absolute example of humility, Jesus' example, who even though he existed as God, uh, he uh, was willing to give up his glory, come humble himself to, to the point of a, a man and even dying on a cross, uh, dying the death of a criminal uh, to pay for the sin uh, of others. So the believers at Philippi needed to humble themselves the way Christ demonstrated this humility. We, we need to have the same thinking in ourselves, uh, Paul says. Well, even in the midst of affliction and difficulty, Paul reminds the believers there in Philippi uh, that uh, there's a recipe for peace and for contentment. Uh, he, he reminds them that believers in Jesus have peace with God. And because of that, uh, we can go to God. We can bring our, our request to Him. Verse uh, 6, uh, we see that we, we should be anxious for nothing, but we should be uh, in prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, bringing our requests to God. And He says in verse 7, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So the recipe for peace, we already have peace with God because of that. If we take our anxieties to Him, we don't need to hold on to those. We don't need to be anxious, uh, and we can have His peace uh, because we trust Him. Uh, then in a few verses uh, following, he describes the recipe for contentment in verses 11 through 13. Uh, he explains that he's content no matter what circumstances he's in. He's learned that. It's not something he, he came to immediately, but he's learned that uh, over, over years of growth. Verse 12, he says, I know how to get along with humble means and to live in prosperity. He, he knows how to deal with uh, being filled and going hungry, of having an abundance and suffering need. Well, what's that secret? What's the secret for contentment? The recipe for contentment is found in uh, 4.13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The one who brings us to the tasks, to the difficulties, uh, is the one who equips us. And uh, we can accomplish what he intends for us to accomplish because of his strength. And Paul had learned that. So he's encouraging the Philippians to walk with God uh, in unity, together, despite difficult situations, difficult circumstances. Uh, Philippians is a fantastic letter for us to, to, to really think through as we're wrestling with uh, hardship, which inevitably comes. Uh, Paul writes to Philemon uh, a couple of years later uh, as he's uh, perhaps nearing the conclusion of his uh, first imprisonment. Uh, he writes to Philemon, uh, who's uh, a believer in Colossae. Uh, uh, and had a slave named Onesimus. Well, that slave ran away, and uh, Paul apparently uh, met Onesimus while he's imprisoned, and uh, they're, they're interacting with each other, and Onesimus comes to know the Lord. And so Paul sends Onesimus back to Philemon, uh, and uh, probably also uh, carrying the letter to the Colossians. That's very possible as well. But the theme is a personal plea for forgiveness. Onesimus had violated the law, had committed a crime worthy of death, and Paul sends Onesimus back. But even more than that, Onesimus returns uh, willingly. Uh, and, and so we look in this very brief letter about uh, Paul's plea uh, for uh, Philemon not only to forgive Onesimus, but to also treat him differently. So we see the, there's the standard greeting and introduction in the first uh, few verses, right? Uh, verses 1 through 3. Uh, then in uh, verses 4 through 7, Paul commends Philemon. Uh, then 8 through 10 is a, uh, uh, a commendation uh, for Philemon, 4 through 7. 8 through 10 is a plea for Onesimus. 11 through 18 uh, describes the usefulness of this newfound usefulness of Onesimus. 19 through 22 is a final plea, and then 23 through 25 is uh, Paul's conclusion. Now, uh, as, as Paul commends Philemon, he reminds of uh, his love and his faith toward, toward Christ and toward all the saints. 
And he, he commends Philemon for these things, right? Reminding of how many times Paul had been comforted uh, by Philemon. And in 8 through 10, he, he states this appeal for Onesimus. He says, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment. Uh, so Onesimus, uh, apparently imprisoned with Paul at that point, comes to know the Lord. Uh, verses 11 through 18, he was formerly useless, but is now useful both to you and me, Paul explains in verse 11. Uh, and uh, uh, he would have loved to have kept Onesimus with him, but he's sending him back, right? Uh, and, and he makes this plea that, uh, uh, that Onesimus should be treated not as a slave, verse 16 says, uh, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially uh, to me. And, and notice how, uh, as, as Paul emphasizes the brotherhood and essential equality of people and brothers in Christ over uh, socioeconomic conditions and over and above slavery, notice the relationship difference between Philemon and Onesimus now. Uh, Onesimus is not a slave to Philemon. Uh, Onesimus is now his brother. Now, uh, Philemon had a legal claim uh, to Onesimus as a slave, and Paul doesn't deny that. Uh, but Paul explains that the brotherhood in Christ trumps that, is superior to that. And that's really helpful for our understanding of uh, individual human rights, uh, uh, the value of humanity, uh, uh, some social political concepts of how we treat each other. Uh, a tremendous, a tremendous appeal on behalf of Onesimus here. And then uh, you, you got to love Paul's demand in, in verse 19. He says, I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. Paul didn't always write all of his letters, right? Uh, tradition tells us he had some kind of an eye issue that made it maybe difficult for him to write, but he used an amanuensis often or a, a secretary or someone just to, to write down what Paul had said. But in this case, he says, I'm writing this with my own hand. And he says, I'll repay anything that's owed. Uh, if, and Onesimus owed Philemon his life. So Paul is saying, if he owes anything, I'll pay it. In other words, take my life, not his. Uh, and then it, it, Paul says, not to mention you owe to me even your own self as well. So I appreciate that, that uh, uh, Paul apparently led Philemon to the Lord and is now uh, challenging Philemon uh, the idea of uh, extending grace to others in Christ. So tremendous letter, uh, helping us to think through uh, contemporary sociopolitical issues, uh, justice issues, uh, human rights and human value issues. Uh, Philemon uh, provides an excellent example in that regard. Paul also writes the letter to the Ephesians during this time, uh, probably 63 AD. And actually, the, uh, the letter isn't, uh, uh, in, in some, some of the manuscripts, isn't addressed specifically to the church at, at Ephesus. Um, uh, but uh, in some of the later manuscripts, it is. So it seems that it was a, a, uh, perhaps an encyclical letter or a letter that was circulated. Um, and uh, so these, these, these believers are, are uh, being told about the church age wealth that they have and how to use it. Uh, these believers in Jesus Christ are told their identity, who they are. Uh, in, in 1 verse 3, they're told about uh, every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ that they have. So Paul writes uh, in the first half of this letter explaining uh, the position of the believer, their identity in chapters 1 through 3. Uh, 1, 1 through 14 describes the basis uh, of, that, of that new identity, and it, it shows in those verses what Father, Son, and Spirit all did to accomplish salvation in this new life for the believer. And that's such an incredible truth that in verses 15 through 23, Paul prays that the, these believers will have incredible understanding, uh, that they'll be strengthened in this understanding of Christ and what he's done. Chapter 2 explains the new life that they have, where they came from, uh, and now the new life that they have, and this peace they have with God. Chapter 3 expresses this new administration, uh, this new power 
uh, and this, this new unity that they have uh, as believers in the body of Christ. And then in chapters 4 through 6, Paul challenges his readers uh, with uh, the expectation or the walk of the believer. The first three chapters, identity of the believer. The second three chapters, the walk of the believer. In chapter 4, he talks about how the believer should be walking in unity, newness, and truth. 5, 1 through 20, in love, righteousness, and wisdom. 5, 21 through 6, 9, walking in submission to one another. And there are specific roles and specific ex expressions of that submission. Then 6, 10 through 24, uh, walking in strength, prayer, peace, and grace. Uh, and, and again, this is a, a, a kind of a tour de force of the doctrine, Christian doctrine, where Romans is the very detailed and technical constitution of the Christian faith. Ephesians is the kind of abridged version that explains similarly to Romans the wealth of the believer, the identity of the believer, the position of the believer, uh, in the first half and in the second half challenges believers to walk in a manner worthy of that calling. So some highlights. Uh, well, we see in uh, chapter 1 the doxological purpose. Uh, in uh, 1 verse 6, 12, and 14, uh, we see why God saved people. Uh, the, the Father uh, chose, predestined, the Son redeems with His blood, the Holy Spirit uh, uh, is, is a pledge, uh, uh, and each person is given the Holy Spirit. Well, well why? Why? Uh, for His glory, the doxological purpose. That's just a technical way uh, of referring to God's plan to glorify Himself, uh, and we call that the doxological purpose, God's purpose to glorify Himself. And what we see in chapter 2, the former identity versus the new identity. Uh, 2, 2 through 6 explains that we're dead in our transgressions and, and uh, we were captivated by uh, the, the devil, the world, and our, our own flesh. We had these enemies that uh, kept us in, in, in bondage, in this deadness, and we're walking as we're living in this deadness. Uh, but uh, in God's grace, uh, we have this new life based on His grace and what He accomplished. In verses 4 through 6, we see He had uh, great mercy. He had great love with which He loved us. And he, while we were dead in transgressions, He made us alive. Uh, this shows that He accomplished it. It's not of our own works, right? He raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly uh, places in Christ so that he'll be glorified, the riches of his grace and kindness would be demonstrated. Well, uh, we, we see the means and the outcome of that salvation in 2, 8 through 10. By grace, we've been saved through faith. The, the vehicle is, is faith, the delivery vehicle for God's grace, this, this kindness that's undeserved. He gave it to us, and how do we receive it? Through faith or belief in him. Uh, this, this grace, this faith, this whole gift of salvation is not uh, of ourselves. It's, it's from God. It's not based on works so that no one can boast. Remember, his purpose, his doxological purpose was stated in chapter 1 as his own glory. Um, so he's designed it in such a way that he's glorified, uh, not us, uh, demonstrating and expressing his character. Uh, and... Uh, Paul adds that we're his workmanship. This is the outcome. We're, we're his craftsmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we'd walk in them. We're made for new things. We're new creatures made for new things. Now, that newness also um, provides new relationships between Jews and Gentiles, people of different ethnicities, that even though we retain our ethnicities, we're one in the body of Christ. And that's this, uh, this, new, this mystery that Paul describes. It's now revealed, now communicated. In the body of Christ, there's unity uh, and there's no differences. Now, those ethnic differences, of course, uh, don't disappear. God has purposes for those things. That diversity is a rich and beautiful thing. But the idea of equality, essential equality in the body of Christ, uh, is, is critical for who we are and how we interact with each other. Uh, and as, he, uh, as Paul moves into the practical side of the letter in chapters 4, 5, and 6, uh, 
in chapter 4, he describes some new roles and how this, how this all came to be. He describes in verse 11, apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Um, some, by the way, talk about gifts of uh, e evangelism, but the evangelist in verse 11 is the gift. Everyone is responsible to communicate the good news. There aren't uh, those who are gifted with the gift of evangelism. These are e evangelists who, who are given to the church. Uh, so you have noticed the chronology. Apostles, right, those that Jesus chose. Prophets, those who are communicating God's word. Evangelists, those who are proclaiming God's word to those who hadn't believed yet. And then the pastors and teachers... Uh, and, and their design is for the equipping of the saints for their work of service. So these new roles are designed for the, the building up of this body of Christ. Interestingly, the role of pastor and teacher, uh, what is a pastor or a shepherd's primary function? To teach the word, it's a, a pastor and a teacher. So these new roles play a, a, a key uh, uh, role in the development of this new body of Christ. Uh, there's a new kind of filling that's described. In chapter 5, 17, and 18, Paul challenges these uh, readers uh, to be wise, understand God's will, and he offers a contrast. Uh, uh, in their previous uh, pursuit, they might be drunk with wine, but he says that's dissipation. Don't be drunk with wine, but instead be filled with the Spirit. That's not a mystical thing. That's it's simply the idea of allowing the Holy Spirit to control you. Think about how, how we might be controlled by wine. We put it in, in our bodies, and we submit to this process, putting more in our bodies and allowing it to do this, this work in us, right, and take control of us. Uh, he's saying don't do that. Instead, uh, allow the Holy Spirit of God to control you that way. How do we do that? Well, His Word... Uh, the more we put His Word in us and then submit to Him, as we discover, and as we saw in Galatians, uh, the, the more He's able to work in us. That's the design. That is how to understand what the will of the Lord is. So there's a new filling for believers. Uh, there's also uh, new relationships. There's this subjection principle Paul talks about in, in verse 21 of chapter 5. He says, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So whereas in uh, their previous uh, manner of life, uh, we, we would be pursuing our own superiority, and our own advantages. But he says that believers ought to be subject to one another in the fear of Christ, perceiving the other to be worthy uh, of more honor, um, as we saw in Philippians chapter 2, for example. And so then Paul outlines the different relationships uh, uh, that would be uh, common in that, in that society and what those relationships would look like. So we'll talk about wives and husbands and, and parents and, and, and children and, and servants and, and masters, right? And he'll discuss how each one is to be subject to the other in their various relationships. Uh, many times when we're talking about those relationships, we might isolate one out of this context and forget that, uh, uh, that the core of how we relate to each other is being subject to one another in the fear of Christ. And then, of course, in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, we have a new weaponry. Paul will describe, of course, the armor of God, uh, and he says in verse 10, Be strong in the Lord and strength of his might. Verse 11, Put on the full armor of God so he'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. So it's about this defensive posture, being able to stand firm, right? And uh, as we get to verse 17, we're told that we should take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Uh, the rest is armor. That's the only uh, piece of weaponry that we have. It's God's Word. And if that is... Uh, our, our, our weapon uh, for our warfare, for the, the task we've been given, then we ought to know it well. Uh, and so Paul is challenging these believers to be skilled in wielding the Word of God, uh, which is the sword of the Spirit, called the sword of the Spirit because it's, uh, it is authored by the Holy Spirit, as Peter explains in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, and as Paul explains in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Okay, in this period of time, uh, as Paul concludes his first imprisonment, uh, 
He writes Colossians, this letter to the Colossians, probably around 63 AD, roughly the same time as uh, uh, these other, other letters. As he, uh, he is writing very similarly to what he described uh, to the Ephesians. Uh, the focus maybe isn't as uh, precise. I think uh, as Ephesians might have been uh, intended for a broader audience, it's a little more uh, technical, structured, and less personal. Uh, whereas the letter to the Colossians, the theme is walking in the all-sufficient Christ. Uh, it's a call to action, um, but it's not as, uh, uh, as divided as uh, the letter to the Ephesians, but they're very, uh, very similar thematically in the themes and the ideas that are talked about. Uh, Paul will, in the first uh, chapter through 2 7 talk about Christ as sufficient for salvation. It's all about Him. Um, he's God. He's, uh, 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 he is our Savior. He is sufficient for our salvation. And if He's sufficient for our salvation, we see in 2 8 through 23, well, He's also sufficient for our growth. Why would we look to Him uh, as being a suitable Savior and then neglect Him uh, for our own personal growth? He is sufficient for our growth. Uh, and if He's sufficient for our growth, as we discover in 3, 1 through 4, 6, then we really ought to be uh, focused on His sufficiency in our walk. We ought to be walking as He's designed with our focus on Him. Uh, and then we see in uh, 4, 7 through the remainder of the chapter, uh, the, the various servants of Christ up through verse uh, 17 and 18, the conclusion of the letter. Uh, th these servants of Christ were demonstrating um, that Christ is sufficient. Uh, some, some highlights here. Again, remember the similarities to Ephesians, and it might be a, a fun exercise to read Ephesians and then also read uh, the letter to the Colossians and just see the similar themes, key ideas. Uh, it, it helps to understand what Paul might mean in one context by looking at what he says about that same idea in another context. So we'll see some of that. Uh, but uh, in Colossians 1.13, for example, uh, Paul will describe and really resolve the, any confusion we might have about the kingdom of God. He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. So we have been, believers have been transferred to the kingdom of His beloved Son. Then he'll explain a little later on that, uh, that uh, because we've been raised with Christ and Christ is above, we need to uh, set our mind on things above where, where He is seated. In other words, the kingdom isn't here. We've been transferred to it. Uh, our, our, uh, our citizenship is with Christ and He's not here yet physically. Uh, in that kingdom rule. So that's, that's very helpful as we, uh, as we move from the Gospels to understanding what this, uh, what this all means, what this kingdom idea means for those of, those of us in the church age today. So we see that uh, key to understanding the kingdom in 1.13. Uh, Paul talks about the deity of Christ as part of the, the sufficiency of Christ. Uh, he's the, invis uh, the image of the invisible God, verse 15, chapter 1. Well, how can you have an image of something invisible? Well, you can. Jesus is it. Uh, he's the firstborn of all creation. That doesn't mean he's the first created thing. He has firstborn sovereign rights. As the Son of God, he has the sovereign rights over creation uh, because he's the creator, verse 16. All things uh, were created by him. Uh, he's before all things, and in Him all things hold together, head of the body, etc. He is God. He is deity. Uh, uh, Paul says that it was God's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him. This Jesus is God, and His deity is attested throughout scriptures. Uh, Paul, uh, a little further in, chapter 2, verse 8, challenges the Colossians, warns them, really, uh, that they not be taken captive through uh, philosophy and empty deceptions that aren't according to Christ, the traditions of men, the elementary principles of the world. Instead, he lays out this kind of biblical wisdom, this kind of uh, wisdom that 
uh, that is of Christ, uh, that uh, that they should be thinking about. We should be meditating upon. We should be focused on. Uh, so, in other words, we need to have the right kind of philosophy. He doesn't condemn philosophy. He says, don't be captivated by the wrong kind of philosophy. Philosophy just means the pursuit of, of wisdom, right? Or the affection of wisdom, love of wisdom. We discover a few verses later uh, in uh, 2.20, uh, Paul will explain that, uh, that um, we've died and been raised with Christ. And so uh, uh, our life is hidden with God. But one day... Uh, will be revealed with Him in glory. And in the meantime, we need to set our minds on the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. That's very helpful, again, in understanding our place in this world, that our, our place isn't in this world, but He's put us here, and so we have stewardships to fulfill, and we walk with Him while we're here, walking in the all-sufficient Christ, uh, even though uh, He's not here uh, physically ruling. Uh, he's here... Uh, in His Spirit who dwells within us. And then, of course, we find uh, the, the seriousness of God's Word in the life of the believer, uh, as he explains in chapter 3, 16, and 17, that we need to let the Word of Christ richly dwell within us. Uh, and, and in verse 17, doing all uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus. So the, the, the Christian should be governed by the Word of God, should should have our, we should have our lives uh, defined by God's Word. We ought to be easily and readily identified by God's Word in our lives. Well, let's think about some worldview implications. Well, lots here, right, uh, as we think about these prison epistles, because Paul is telling these different churches and believers uh, who they are in Christ. That has to do with their, their metaphysics, their ontology, their identity. Uh, he explains to them, the Ephesians and the Colossians, uh, what God has designed, the teleology of the, of the Christian life, of a person, right? Uh, and of course, the, the eschatology, the Colossians chapter 3, the future. We will one day uh, be glorified with, with Christ, but in the meantime, we've got work to do here, and we need to have our minds set on the things above. Uh, so this plays into uh, Christian ethics, right? Uh, why in the world would believers, um, why would anybody be submissive to, to others? Well, Paul explains that, and uh, Ephesians 5.21 sets the tone. Uh, uh, Philippians chapter 2 shows how Christ demonstrated this great humility. We should be thinking the same way. Well, that's an ethical mandate for believers to have this kind of humility, and it doesn't align with a, an atheistic or a secular worldview. Uh, and so, again, we see the biblical model is very different than other models. The epistemology, uh, uh, going back to God's Word as the authority, uh, we're not to be controlled by wine, as Paul says, we're to be controlled by the, the Spirit of God. Uh, we shouldn't be captivated by false philosophies that aren't according to Christ, but we should be pursuing the true philosophy, right? And then in Philemon, we see the uh, uh, aspects of... Uh, human identity and human value, again, metaphysical com concepts that have great socio-political ideas of how we treat other people uh, as creations of God and as uh, uh, to having that position of treating one another as worthy of more honor than ourselves. So the, the tremendous worldview implications in these passages. As we think about uh, uh, our own personal reflections. I encourage you as, you as you read these passages to spend time uh, reflecting, not just learning and knowing the data, but really reflecting and thinking about, uh, uh, about how these things impact uh, your, your walk with the Lord. Well, for me, uh, I, I really uh, focus on uh, Ephesians chapter 1, that that second half of the chapter, where Paul is really praying that believers will understand and be just strengthened in the understanding of Christ, the knowledge of Christ. Uh, and I'm, I'm so grateful that he provides us all this data, all this information, so that we can know him better and be strengthened, uh, and that we can understand who he is, 
w who we are, uh, what our identity is. We can have absolute certainty. Uh, we don't have to uh, have any confusion or doubt as to our identity and our relationship with Him. And that is a tremendous, tremendous wealth in itself. Uh, much to reflect on, and I, I trust that as you uh, spend time in these passages, you will do just that. As you prepare for uh, our next episode, uh, you've got some reading to do. Uh, in the next episode, we'll take a look at 1 Timothy, Titus, and 2 Timothy, the pastoral epistles. These letters uh, are very personal to Paul as he writes to these two men that he's discipled and trained up and that he is challenging to effective ministry, uh, Timothy in Ephesus and Titus in Crete. Uh, and so uh, he'll write to Timothy and Titus while free, and then he'll be imprisoned again writing to 2 Timothy. So you get a very personal flavor as you read through 2 Timothy. So as you spend more time in the Word, I pray that you'll be encouraged and strengthened in the knowledge of Christ, and that you'll continue your journey through the New Testament so that you can know Him better, understand who He is, uh, understand who you are, who He has designed you to be, and uh, walk more closely with Him. Enjoy your time in the Word, and until then, we'll see you next time.